Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, options if you would like to launch your own validator node and talk about what the node infrastructure landscape looks like in Ethereum currently and you know why it's important that if you can, you consider running your own node. So my name is Maggie Love. Um, I guess next slide. Clicker. Cool. So my name is Maggie Love. I'm one of the co-founders and director of ecosystem and partnerships for Web3 Cloud. I'm also the founder of Shefi. Um, and that's me on Twitter, and this is Shane. So Shane is the co-founder of Decentralized Authority, and uh, our teams are working together on some uh, different plays in the node infrastructure space. And uh, just a bit about Web3 Cloud. So we are a compute and storage hardware infrastructure provider powering Web3, and we're also a joint venture between Consensus and Advanced Micro Devices. And really our goal is to provide the uh, infrastructure for many Web3 protocols, so the protocols on the software side can just focus on scaling, and uh, building it Web3 natively, so building infrastructure that's Web3 native. Okay, so uh, why is validating important, right? So Ethereum believes that validators will play an active part in Ethereum's future, and that they are key to more secure, scalable, and sustainable Ethereum. Um, I got this quote from an article. I, I post all the things I take from. And really, this is uh, the validators are really important to Ethereum. If you heard Danny Ryan's opening talk, uh, resiliency is incredibly important in this space. And we're going to touch on that again today in this presentation. OK, so I had a spicy tweet uh, earlier this year. And it kind of sparked me to go further down this rabbit hole and sort of why I'm here today. It got a lot of airplay, and I spent like two minutes on it, so I was really surprised. All right, so uh, you know, what does it mean to be decentralized? And should uh, protocols like Ethereum and others be concerned if more than 50% you know, of their nodes are running on one hosting provider? What are some of the things we have to consider? Uh, you know, decentralization is a, a key tenet of at least the Ethereum ecosystem, not every ecosystem. And so I wanted to challenge that notion that if we say this is important, uh, are we actually decentralized? And um, because of this tweet, Hertzner, so you can see there's 16.9% of the ecosystem, uh, responded to my tweet saying they were banning uh, running Ethereum nodes on their infrastructure. So they're a data center within Germany uh, that a lot of uh, nodes are running on. So we can start to see the issues here uh, if we're not thinking about how to decentralize across hosting providers. Uh, because Hertzner did it, they're smaller, but potentially Amazon could do it. Um, and one of the Ethereum uh, Foundation members, Peter uh, Wright, kind of commented on that, you know, uh, it's important to update the validator ecosystem so more people can run it at home, update the protocol itself. And, you know, if that's not happening, then people are going to go with the easy uh, hosting providers and may not be aware of some of the risks that could happen. So um, that was a fun, fun week or so of notifications. And so really quickly, I just wanted to do a poll uh, because this was a big part of the debate on, on the Twitter thread. How many of you think uh, centralization of node infrastructure is a concern for Ethereum? OK, great. So. Uh, all of us are here because we're probably curious about decentralization and believe it's important through, for a resilient uh, protocol. And so then the goal of this workshop today uh, is to teach you about the importance of running your own node to contribute to the resilience and decentralization of the network and also to protect yourself from penalties. So what we'll go over today, actually the Ethereum uh, protocol incentivizes you to be running your own node and not to be uh, aggregated in a majority of any kind. And so we'll get a bit more into that. So really quickly, the agenda. Uh, why did Ethereum move to proof of stake? Node infrastructure landscape and examining decentralization across layers in that landscape. And then node runner options. And so Shane will get up here uh, to run you through different node runner options at the end. OK, so proof of stake and solo staking 101. So Shifa is an educational initiative uh, to onboard women and non-binary folks into the crypto ecosystem. So I am a teacher, uh, part of my time in the space. So if some of this is familiar to you, um, 
I like to make sure everyone's on the same page by explaining things before we dive in. So a quick proof of stake glossary for those of you who may be unfamiliar. Uh, so proof of stake is a consensus mechanism where validators put capital at risk by staking it to validate blocks of transactions and secure the network. And consensus mechanisms are just how a blockchain protocol or a group of any time, any kind really uh, comes to the source, source of truth about something. And it's really important in blockchain protocols, especially Ethereum, that we have one single source of truth in order for it to function properly. Uh, staking is just the act of locking up or depositing crypto. And a validator note, so really what we're focusing on today, is a note that processes transaction, uh, sorry, adds new blocks to the blockchain and stores data. A uh, little misspelling there. And so they're responsible for proposing blocks of transactions and attesting uh, the transactions and blocks are true. So if you're running a validator node, they're uh, sometimes responsible for proposing the block transactions and sometimes for attesting that the transactions a different block proposer is proposing are true. So that's your quick glossary for those of you who aren't familiar. And so why did Ethereum move to proof of stake? Uh, reducing barriers to entry for network participants. So more people have capital to stake uh, than in proof of work where you would need uh, GPUs, electricity, power, a lot of capital in order to validate transactions and secure the network. Uh, reduce Ethereum's carbon footprint by 99.5%. Uh, that's really exciting for the ecosystem, especially when we're thinking about attracting new applications and users who are uh, extremely concerned and because we love the Earth and we want it to be around for a long time. Uh, reduce the ETH issuance. Uh, so the protocol itself uh, you know, issues less ETH to the validators than in proof of work. And so also means that we need to issue less ETH to incentivize validators to secure the network. And so 51% attacks are more costly and difficult to do than they were in proof of work. And it's easier to have a social recovery if something happen, uh, negative happens. And then this is the point uh, we're going to examine today and why it's in bold. And so it's reducing the centralization risk of validator nodes. So there's a big concern in proof of work mining of these large mining pools of a lot of GPU miners, like having a somewhat control over the network and being highly centralized. So proof of stake is supposed to reduce that. Uh, you know, a group of validator nodes having uh, a lot of power. And so what are the requirements if you would like to be a validator in Ethereum's proof of stake? Um, so, you know, to participate in any consensus mechanism, to participate in a network, to be allowed to potentially uh, earn rewards for doing so, you must commit some type of capital. In a proof of stake, it's 32 ETH. And this collateral can be penalized or even slashed if the validator is lazy or dishonest. So you're putting up that capital at risk likely incentivizing you to behave well uh, because you would not like to lose money. And also you have to run three pieces of software. So if you want to run your own solo validator node, it's not just about uh, putting up the capital. Uh, there's a bit more work to it. So you have to run an execution client, a consensus client, and a validator. And so why solo validate? Uh, you'll earn ETH directly from the protocol. So if you're staking with Lido or Coinbase or some other exchange, uh, they're going to take a cut of those earnings for running those validators for you. And so Coinbase takes about 25% cut of earnings from stakers. <clears throat> uh, your keys and your crypto. So when you're staking with other entities, they ultimately have your private keys. And so you ultimately do not have final access to your crypto, which is not the case if you solo validate. So you're in complete control of your validator and your crypto. Uh, control of the clients and hardware setup. Uh, so there's recommended hardware setups, but you know you can uh, you're not locked into one type of setup. And reduce the risk of large event slashing. So we're going to go over this a bit more. But if you're joining a large pool that has um, majority of the network, and if something happens to that pool, they go offline, they have trouble um, accessing the network, you're going to get slashed as part of that. But if you're a solo staker, you're not going to run into that risk. And then once again, you don't have to trust a third party for running the node, and information coming from that node is true. So you know, whenever you're staking with somebody else and they're managing all the infrastructure and the information coming from that node, or even if you're running a decentralized application and you're not running your own nodes, you always have to trust wherever you're getting information from is true. 
right? And this is what we're excited about. Uh, if you're solo staking, you're improving the resilience, robustness, decentralization, and security of the Ethereum protocol. Uh, but there are some challenges with solo validating. And so uh, this morning, this was the price of 32 ETH, uh, which is not accessible to many who want to stake at home. Even if we think about how large DevCon is right now, it was not this large for the past other DevCons. And so we're having a lot of new participants joining our ecosystem, and it's really hard to accumulate 32 ETH. Uh, so there is still a cost of hardware, electricity, ongoing maintenance of these nodes. It's not set it and forget it in your home. You have to have technical know-how to develop and operate an Ethereum validator. So there's lots of tutorials, um, but if you're not very technical, it will be difficult. A secure key management, so whenever you're managing your own keys, you have to have very good practices around keeping it secure. Uh, if you lose your keys, it's not a good situation for you. And so you also want to make sure you have a stable internet connection, and so it reduces the risk of slashing or pen penalties and maximizes rewards. And then, as you know, right now, even if you're staking uh, with a non-liquid staking protocol, I should say, so on an exchange or on your own, uh, your Ethereum is locked up until the Shanghai update, I believe, or upgrade. And right now, uh, post-merge, that's about 6 to 12 months, but there's no exact timeline. So that means you can't do anything with that ETH while it's locked up. You can't put it anywhere else or use it anywhere else in the ecosystem. You can't sell it. Um, it's locked up until this next upgrade. And so also, uh, we won't get too in the weeds about this, uh, but solo stakers are at greater risk of a denial of service attack, or DDoS, uh, because your, uh, if you're chosen to be the block producer, uh, other players in the network can actually see that, uh, because you're not in a pool, so you're not obfuscated, and so they can actually, um, you can have a denial of service. If you're not familiar with, a, with what a denial of service attack is, uh, Solana outages are commonly a denial of service attack. So all those memes on the internet, you see them about going down, happen uh, from this. Not to, you know, say anything bad about Solana. So then what is the validator landscape reality taking into account the requirements and the challenges? Um, so right, what if a person doesn't have 32 ETH? What if they don't have the technical know-how? What if they don't have the time uh, and ability to continue managing after setup? Uh, so um, she could stake via a service, a pool, or an exchange. And these options are wonderful because they increase the participation uh, of individuals staking in the Ethereum network. Uh, but they aren't ideal for resilience, robustness, security, and all those things we want uh, for the Ethereum protocol. And so then, knowing this, knowing that there's more options, what is the actual state of the validator landscape today? So really quickly, uh, the Ethereum validator landscape has many players. And so we have smart contract platforms, so layer ones like Ethereum. We have software infrastructure providers. We have hardware infrastructure providers as well. Uh, we have solo stakers. We have liquid staking protocols. We have staking service businesses, liquid stakers, and we have investors. So there's actually many players that contribute to the uh, staking landscape. Um, so today, uh, for the rest of this presentation, before we get into the node running options, we're going to look at the decentralization of the different layers of the node landscape. So hosting providers. Uh, 60 plus percent of Ethereum nodes are hosted on centralized services. I think the number is actually closer to 70. Uh, pool distribution. Uh, so you know the different pools and how much ETH they have staked in them or how much dominance they have. Uh, Lido, Coinbase, Kraken, Binance, etc. Uh, node client uh, diversity. So it's really important that we're not all running the same node client, so we're going to examine that. And then geographic node distribution, right? We don't want to all be running our nodes out of uh, US Virginia East, the big Amazon data center. And then coin ownership distribution, right? So uh, depending on how much uh, you know power and staked capital you have on the network, especially these pools, you're going to have more coins and more rewards and uh, you know, more potential political say. So first we're gonna look at the node distribution. So this doesn't break down by hosting providers, uh, but you can see uh, hosting is 63.9%. Um, this is taken from ethernodes.org. You can go there right now and you can look up these charts in real time. And so uh, right now, most people aren't solo staking. Most people are staking with some type of provider that's staking with a hosting provider. 
And, and so, so what, what this actually, actually looks like, this was the chart that <laughs> made the tweet blow up. And actually, the number of nodes on Amazon have increased since my tweet in August. And so hosting distribution. So Amazon, we still have quite a few on Hertzner. Uh, and so right, um, if you know Amazon cannot process blocks, something happens to all those nodes, um, they're such a supermajority that would impact everybody uh, staking on that infrastructure. And you might not be aware, because you're staking through a service provider, that uh, you would be in that slashing pool. Uh, so it's definitely something to consider. And then just the performance, right, of the network. Uh, you know, we're familiar with, in the proof of work world, when there was high transaction volume, things would get expensive, transactions would get dropped. It was a really unpleasant experience. Um, this can still happen if something, if there's some type of outage with Amazon. It can make the user experience and actually doing transactions very poor, even if the entire network doesn't go down itself. So then we have depositors by category. Uh, so you can see it's staking pools is the largest and then exchanges. So the combined staking pool plus exchanges really makes up the majority of um, what's being deposited on the network and you know, um, that has many other implications. Oh, I went back. And so uh, in September, uh, you know, 13.5 million ETH uh, were staked. So a lot of money. And more than 60% of the ETH was sitting with Lido, Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance. Uh, so all of these entities have a much higher likelihood of being um, assigned to produce blocks of transactions because they have more staked ETH. And so some of the concerns that were brought up when this happened or when this was realized is um, obviously they're getting more of the rewards. They're earning most of the money coming from the network. Um, and there's a lot of discussion around censoring transactions around the network. A lot of them use MEV Boost. Um, if you're aware of what happened with the OFAC um, sanctions and Tornado Cash, um, these uh, um, entities producing blocks uh, were able to censor transactions that are based on uh, o vaccinations and so allowing you know unequal access and making Ethereum not a neutral network. And so uh, more importantly, and this is happening right now, you can see what's going on between Lido and others, is that they're defining the rules on block formation and what type of blocks get created. Once again, so they can say like these type of transactions can be included in blocks, uh, these types of transactions should not be included in blocks. So they're going to be able to set the um, rules of how things work in Ethereum proof of stake. And then other staking entities, if they don't follow these rules, could be penalized. So um, it's really important that not you know one group of uh, entities uh, producing blocks uh, are creating the rules for the entire network. And so this is from Martin Kopelman. If you don't follow him, I highly suggest it. Uh, founder of Gnosis and OG Ethereum uh, person, and I believe now working on Gnosis Chain. Uh, he has a lot of great material around kind of like watching what's happening since the merge. Um, so, you know, a lot of people agreed that it's not great that, you know, Lido and Coinbase are producing all the blocks. And so um, another uh, type of, you know, decentralization or in this case diversity that's really important to blockchain networks is client diversity. And so right now you can see GAP has 77% of the... Uh, consensus clients, so what people are running. And so, once again, Peter, he's another good person to follow if you're more curious about what's happening. Um, you know, it is uh, similar to if all the nodes are being hosted in one place or all, there's a lot in a pool. If something happens to the consensus client later, uh, people will also get slashed if you're running that same consensus client. And so, um, you know, I read an article that it's not great to have one consensus client. It's better to have a majority in Ethereum uh, purposely, uh, sorry, a diversity, uh, had multiple clients running, but it's actually worse to have multiple clients and one in a super majority than it is to have one consensus client. Uh, so it is something people are working on and there are other clients that you can run. So you can see once again, um, there are ways to monitor it, you can uh, find it, but it's still, um, you know, Geth is in the lead and it's a big concern uh, for many um, people that are worried about the health of the network. So really quickly, just a couple examples. Um, so there are risks of infrastructure hosting pool and client centralization. Uh, so in any of these groups, if one third of the validators, or like slightly more than one third, uh, run into an issue, the network will start slashing that group. So anybody that's in that group. 
Um, and why? So consensus needs two thirds of validator agreement. And so if you're in a group that's more than one third of the nodes running into issues, that group gets slashed until the amount of ETH inside that group is below one third of the total stake. So you just keep, and when we say slash, it means that ETH is being taken from you. And so if you're in that group, you're gonna just kind of uh, bleed ETH until you're less than one third. And so right now the Ethereum network has three major attack factors within clients, Prism, Lighthouse, or Geth. And so if something goes wrong in those, that whole group starts getting slashed. And like really quickly, once again, let's say Amazon has an outage issue or decides to censor, and they have 53% of the hosting nodes right now. Uh, these nodes will all start getting slashed until the value is less than one third. And so, you know, going from 53% below to 33% before the slashing would end. So anyone hosted on Amazon would suffer as a part of that. And so you as an individual don't have control because you're a part of this potential slashing group. And also, as I mentioned, you may have no idea uh, where your nodes are being hosted if you're going through some other type of service provider. And right, once again, 80%, I think it was about 77, uh, use the Geth client. If something happens with the Geth client and they make a mistake on the client, 80% of the network would be slashed. And so like the network cannot finalize in these cases. Uh, it can't come to finality, which is important for updating the state of the network. And the penalties are much more severe for those using Geth because of the inactivity leak. So everyone using Geth is impacted. And so their stake is burned or slashed until the beacon chain can finalize again. Um, and this is just a repeat bullet. So whether it's hosting, whether it's pool, because the pool is hosting there, or the pool in general, or whether it's at the client consensus le uh, level, um, there's a lot of risk of centralization and you being penalized as a validator. Um, and so like, to what degree does decentralization matter in these networks? There's like a big debate on that. And like every blockchain protocol has their own version of how decentralized they want to be. Um, and there was a talk uh, by Tech from Gnosis Chain and you know, he was mentioning that uh, Gnosis Chain wants to be one of the most decentralized networks, and that there tends to be a bit of a tragedy of the commons when it comes to decentralization, or it's like this uh, creeping phenomenon where people don't actually care about it until it's too late, so until this large group starts getting slashed. So not something that matters because the performance of the network is running fine, and most users, probably especially ones not at a technical developer conference are not that worried about decentralization. They're worried about, you know, being able to successfully use their app. And right, the Ethereum network goal is to be a credibly uh, neutral, resilient, scalable, and global settlement layer. And the Ethereum validator goal you probably have, or if you're staying somewhere else, is to be a performant validator, earn rewards, and avoid penalties. And so, right, as we've been, um, as I mentioned today, the Ethereum network actually encourages decentralization. Uh, less penalties for running your own validator node, for running your own individual client, uh, for not hosting or going through a pool. And in general, um, the Ethereum community is working uh, across all these points of centralization, uh, two ways to decentralize these uh, different aspects. So the node infrastructure layer, the pools, the client diversity, uh, the geographic distribution, and block construction. So these are things, and coin distribution. Uh, this is not a presentation that the Ethereum ecosystem is like for the first time hearing. They're very aware of all these things and working uh, very hard uh, to improve their resilience, decentralization, and uh, even different staking providers are trying to you know, distribute where they uh, run their nodes. Okay, so now I'm going to pass it to Shane uh, from Decentralized Authority to talk about different node running options. All right. So, having an understanding now of kind of the, 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 the landscape uh, within Ethereum and the requirements for being a node runner, what options are there for actually running your own nodes? So, actually, let me get the clicker from you. Oh, uh, let's see here. There you go. So, Node Runner landscape. Advanced users, the world is their oyster because, you know, they can, uh, uh, or well, there are going to be some skills required if you're an advanced user. Uh, we're talking about you understand Linux administration, you understand networking, 
uh, scripting, Docker. These are all skills that you have. And so because of that, uh, you have numerous resources for learning about uh, which nodes you want to run, which clients you want to run, how you want to run them. Uh, there's a lot of documentation with every single client about uh, becoming an Ethereum validator with them. Uh, there's no limitation on the location of where you want to host your nodes, and there's no limitation on the, the client choice because you can take anything and, and run with it because you have the skills to be able to do that. You can also create custom tooling. So you're a developer, you're, uh, you're competent on the node running side. You can also develop your own tooling for monitoring, for uh, notifications, things of that nature. So if you're an advanced user, there's a lot of options for you out there. Now, the entry-level users, uh, so these are the folks that don't have all of the, uh, all the skills uh, mentioned above. Well, the good news is there are three different uh, GUI-based uh, software options. So this significantly streamlines the, the level of skill that you need in order to run a validator. Um, you might be limited on the location on where you can uh, host that validator. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into some of that, but uh, with with an entry node uh, or with an entry level user, you're much more likely to probably want to run it at home. Uh, you also might be limited on the client choice uh, because if you're using a software platform, you're limited to whatever software or whatever clients that software has available to you. But the good news is minimal skill is required. Uh, most of the, mostly it's copy and paste with anything uh, that, you know, any commands that you have to do, it's just copy and paste. So there are really good options out there. So that's what I want to talk about, uh, entry level. So this is uh, uh, Sterium, I believe it's pronounced. This is a very cool option. Uh, it, it's, I'm categorizing it as a remote server control. Uh, controller. So what you do is you can actually install their application on, uh, it's cross-platform too, so Windows, Mac, Linux. You install it on your, uh, on your computer, and then you can connect it to a remote server. And they have a very simple tutorial on like setting up a remote server with different cloud providers. Uh, but really what happens is after you just sign up for a server, you can actually point their application to that server, and then the application takes care of everything. Uh, and it actually does it through a really cool technology called Ansible. So it basically is able to send, uh, send commands to the server to set it up perfectly for you. Uh, the good, and so with this kind of setup, entry or uh, skill-wise, you can be a novice. Uh, they have great tutorials. It's very simple to set up. Time-wise, you're looking at maybe about an hour uh, or less. If, if you're following their tutorials, it can be done very efficiently. Notable features. Uh, it's, it's got, got a complete GUI user experience. Everything's in-house. Uh, they're not using third parties. They build everything internal. It's a really a great suite in that sense. Uh, you have a lot of location freedom. Because this is a remote node uh, controller, you can host your node really anywhere on any kind of provider. Uh, and so you really have a lot of location freedom. Uh, you have extensive client options. They do a great job with giving you tons of different client options. So you could actually take a look at uh, those charts that Maggie was showing on, okay, which ones are over that 33%. Uh, and you most likely don't want to be in that group because if something happens, so if say you're with Prism and something happens to uh, the Prism client, there, there's a mistake uh, in an update, what have you, what happens is if they're over one third, that whole group is gonna start getting slashed. So you wanna be in a smaller client group, and that's actually what's brilliant about how Ethereum is designed, is they want client diversity so that you don't have the whole network hinging on one client. Another platform, uh, Avado. This is a really cool platform. Uh, it's different than the other one because this is a hardware platform. So this is something where you have to actually buy their hardware in order to uh, use their software. So it's kind of like that complete package, which is great for some users, where they just want to buy it and have a real easy kind of uh, point-and-click setup. But you know, you, you do need to buy their hardware. Uh, you can't just use it on your own hardware, you see, and you also don't have hardware choice. Uh, but skill level-wise, novice. 
very easy to use. Uh, we're talking an hour, maybe a little bit more to set up. It's a little, uh, there, there's a few more steps in it, but it's still a great user experience. Some notable features is there's no OS configuration because you're buying the uh, hardware. You don't have to set up the OS. It's a full package in that way. Uh, they also have a really impressive app store where you can uh, deploy nodes from other blockchains or uh, other clients, and it's really cool. For validation, though, from my understanding, uh, I think there, there's a limitation on what uh, clients they currently offer for validators. So you might be uh, limited in your client choice with a platform like Avado until they add more clients uh, that can be used as a validator. Uh, probably the most popular that people know of is Dapnode. So Dapnode, it's a server platform. So this is one where if you have your own server, you can set it up and run it. Uh, skill level wise, I give this a moderate, and the reason I give it a moderate is because there's a lot of options. So for some users, having that that amount of options could actually be something that is very uh, intimidating. And so, uh, but there are some great tutorials that you know can take people through. You know, setting setting everything up for a DAP node. Uh, it takes a little bit more time because there are more options. There's a few more things you need to set up. Um, but their approach is really cool. Uh, so notable features wise, they they have this modular approach. So you can choose you know different monitoring tools that you want to use with your uh, with your node. And they have a really cool way of just being able to kind of create this. Uh, this way of just deploying different uh, packages, as they call them, deploying different packages that are kind of part of your validator suite, if you will. So there's a lot of customization there. Um, uh, the, the, they have a very simplified OS installer, so you can actually install it from a Ubuntu image that they provide, and it just streamlines the whole process, so there's less that people have to do. Uh, they have a very impressive app store as well. Uh, far beyond actually nodes, they also allow you to uh, host your own dApps and things of that nature. And so there's a lot of options, especially or in the Ethereum ecosystem, there's a lot of options that you can do with dApp nodes. So a very impressive platform. And it's advanced user friendly. So advanced users can actually do a lot of modifying. Uh, there's a lot of kind of, uh, um, there, there's kind of this like uh, uh, tweaking community inside of dApp node where people are able to to set things up in a certain way to uh, you know achieve certain goals, and so that's a really cool advantage to being kind of uh, this platform is there's places you can go far beyond whatever's in the uh, just in the GUI itself. So, uh, Node software is the best way to decentralize, and that is my argument. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because Node software can encourage anyone to run validators from home. You don't have to use a cloud platform if you can easily and simply run validator nodes at home. Uh, it ensures that updates and best practices are being applied. So if, if, if say, someone wants to run a, uh, a um, uh, Ethereum validator, but they, uh, but they don't have software options, they're going to have to go through these very complex tutorials on, on trying to copy and paste all these commands into you know, terminal in order to try to get it all working, but they don't know exactly if everything's working properly. They don't really understand how everything's working. That's actually where Node software can come in because it can standardize how things operate uh, and ensure that best practices are being deployed when you deploy a node, uh, when you deploy a validator. Uh, it also simplifies uh, client adoption. You know, ultimately, if you have options inside of these uh, software platforms, you can choose you know, which clients you want to use. Uh, ultimately, that's where software can go. And software can make it just really easy for people to uh, pick their clients and pick the small ones and the unused ones. So, uh, so what are some challenges to developing Node software? If that's kind of one of the key ways that we can really encourage people to run at home, what are some of the challenges? Well, it requires full stack development skills. So we're talking back end to front end. So you have to be really familiar with the whole back end. You have to be able to deploy nodes, uh, understand Docker, or uh, if, you're, if you're just deploying them directly onto the OS, there's a lot that you have to figure out on that side. Plus, you have to worry about the front end. So you really, it, it, the software has to be uh, really a full stack software uh, in order to really be able to meet all the requirements 
to be a good running Node software. We're also talking about you have to have a deep understanding of Node running itself. You have to understand the best practices. You have to understand what your software needs to look for, X, Y, Z. Uh, while also, you know, right brain, left brain, you also have to think about the user, the creative side of figuring out user experience, what will engage users, what will make them want to use your software. So you really have to have a deep understanding on both sides of that. Minimal no tooling is a, uh, there's minimal no tooling. Uh, that, that's kind of a weird sentence, but minimal no, minimal toolings out there for people who are wanting to develop no software. That's just kind of the reality of where we're at right now. So if someone went, hey, I want to develop Node software, you're kind of starting from scratch. You've got to develop everything on your own with all this understanding. Uh, and so that's those are kind of the challenges that we see right now in getting more Node software out to more people. But uh, I didn't really give an introduction to decentralized authority. What we're doing is we are developing software. Uh, and specifically Node software. And so uh, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about how we can see the Node landscape changing with Node software with tools like Node Launcher, which is a TypeScript uh, Node deployment engine. So Node Launcher is an open source Node deployment engine written in TypeScript that enables the easy creation of Node development applications. So if someone wants to create a application uh, that is for running nodes, what Node Launcher does is it allows them to start developing that application without needing to understand the back end because it's a full deployment engine. It will deploy the nodes in the proper way uh, using APIs. The features, nodes can be deployed and controlled through standard APIs. You don't have to know how to uh, deploy something on Docker, all the proper Docker configs, all this stuff. You just simply need to be able to understand a TypeScript API, which TypeScript is, uh, you know, amazing for uh, application development, and you can be off to the races to develop your own Node software. Uh, you are able to programmatically deploy nodes and upgrade them to validators. So one of the, and what does programmatically mean here? In this case, uh, like with the other platforms that we showed, there's, there's, there's manual steps that you have to take in the, uh, in the process. You either have to copy a file over here, you have to, uh, you have to save this, you have to do, you know, so there's, uh, in the process of deploying a node with those other software platforms, there are certain processes that require human intervention. Programmatically means you're able to do this entirely through programs. So you can actually have all the elements that would require, a, you know, uh, a human to copy this over here, to do this over here. You can have that all done in a programmatic way. So it creates a much more seamless uh, user experience. And you have way more control over the nodes and how they're configured because it's all programmatically designed. You have seamless client updates uh, with Node Launcher. If there's a new client, we, uh, uh, and this actually ties in with this point down here, we have a client test suite. So I'll kind of tackle these in a uh, scenario that's happened recently where we have a client test suite where when a new client comes out, we're able to test it uh, against this library to make sure that nothing breaks inside of this library uh, which no applications can use. Well, uh, earlier this year, uh, the Geth, uh, Geth nodes came out with uh, a new version that actually sunset a, uh, a configuration. Uh, and it wasn't like widely used, but it was a configuration in there, but it wasn't in the release notes. So we actually put it through our test, in, or our, our test suite, and we realized we were getting all these red flags. We reached out to them, and they're like, oh yeah, they uh, uh, were you know, sunsetting this. You know, but it wasn't in the release notes. So there's, there's, there's elements to where, you know, even on the client side, they can just make an update to something, not realizing that other people might be using different configurations that would affect that. This is where Node Launcher comes in by, uh, this can actually eliminate, so uh, eliminate that attack vector, or, or not necessarily attack vector, but that slash event where if there's a problem with Geth and there's a, uh, a feature that people are requiring and that's suddenly taken away and it's not realized how widely it's used, uh, Node Launcher would catch that before the upgrade happens. So that's the advantage of, uh, some, of thinking, thinking uh, holistically about the back end of running nodes. So this is an example of what a simple API could look like. So for, for application developers, this is what you need to 
allow your application to deploy a Ethereum validator. For the developers out there, this is simple. This is super simple. You're not having to touch Docker. You're not having to touch anything on the system. The library itself is doing everything for you in the back end with best practices, and this is all you have to add to your application. So, Node Launcher. Is it in use? Yes, it is. Node Launcher has been uh, well battle tested through Node Pilot. Node Pilot is a uh, consumer facing node management software that uh, we've been developing. We're currently in beta. We're hoping to come out with version one, uh, Q1 of next year, uh, and make it fully open source. Uh, so far, thousands of nodes and validators have been actually launched through Node Pilot. So it's been heavily used. Um, uh, it, it started off primarily in another network, uh, Pocket Network, uh, which actually serves uh, RPC calls to Ethereum applications. So it's a really cool, uh, it's a really cool synergy there. But uh, but the interesting thing about Node Pilot is the fact that Node Pilot is 62% CSS, 25% SCSS, and 13% JavaScript. So we're talking about like a web application, but yet it's able to run and deploy nodes and create a user interface and a user experience that allows more people to have access to node running, and it's just a simple application. Ultimately, with Node Launcher, any developer can start creating node deployment applications like Node Pilot. We want to open up this space so that there's innovation happening on the user side of node uh, software, because we want more and more users to be attracted to the space and more users are going to be attracted to the space when we have these kind of uh, uh, when we have these kind of software that meet different users with where they're at or the features that they're looking for. We can see that innovation start to grow with tools like Node Launcher. Uh, and so we've actually begun testing uh, Node Launcher with Ethereum. Node Launcher we successfully launched a testnet Ethereum validator last week using entirely uh, only. Node launcher, so we're very excited about that. Uh, we saw some refactoring, to, or we're, we were in the middle of refactoring. I was talking to the dev yesterday, and uh, he's like, well, yeah, well, the version right now uh, has some bugs because I was refactoring and broke it. So right now, what we currently have in our GitHub is broken, but that's the beauty of what we're doing. Is we're, we're, we're building it out, uh, and we're uh, and then once we're ready to make it production ready, it's in a, uh, uh, right now it's in its own dedicated branch. Um, but once we push it to master, then anyone could actually use Node Launcher to create uh, validators for Ethereum. Uh, we want to add multiple clients uh, by the end of the year. Uh, development progress uh, can be followed on our GitHub, which is Node Launcher, uh, decentralized or our, our decentralized authority GitHub. Uh, and we hope to see developers use this tool uh, or use tools like Node Launcher uh, to create next generation Node software, where it's super user focused, super. Uh, uh, super feature rich so that it can attract more people to want to, you know, if they're considering, hey, should I put my, uh, should I put my stake in a staking service or should I run it on my own? It's just so simple to run on your own and there's so many options for running on your own that you don't even need to consider giving your keys and uh, putting your trust in someone else. So kind of in conclusion then with everything that uh, Maggie uh, talked about and then what I'm kind of closing here with, uh, in conclusion, Ethereum is designed for optimal decentralization. It's really designed to push folks to decentralization by having those large slashing events where if you're part of too large of a group, you know, using a certain client or on a certain cloud provider, you'll start getting slashed if there's an issue there. It really incentivizes the run at home decentralized kind of ecosystem. Uh, validators can protect themselves by potentially, uh, from potentially large losses by avoiding uh, oversaturated cloud providers. AWS, 53%. It's starting to get to a point where it's a risk if you deploy on AWS simply because if something happens there, even if it just goes offline, they have a DNS error, you know, and something goes offline, which happened last year. They had entire data centers going down because uh, an admin accidentally pushed a patch to their DNS that broke everything. Um, that you know, those kind of those kind of simple things could actually affect the entire network. So it's becoming a risk to be on these large platforms, uh, and then use clients with less utilization in the network itself. Right now, if you're using Prism or Lighthouse, you're in that 40% range. Uh, so if something were to happen to either of those clients, 
you could potentially see uh, large losses. Uh, but the good news is, is there are great options for entry-level users to participate in the Ethereum validation. I definitely encourage you to go look at those options. They are listed on ethereum.org uh, when it says uh, 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 stake Ethereum, and they talk about different options. All these options are there because they were open source, all three that I mentioned. They're really great options. There's no reason to not run your own Ethereum node today. Uh, but, but then, then kind, kind of looking, looking to the future, we are very excited. We're very bullish on where no software can go uh, and the kind of user experience that can become standard for no software. Uh, and, you know, we're excited to be working on our side on the uh, tooling side, whether through clouds working on the uh, infrastructure and hardware side. So really the future is super bright with Ethereum validation. We want to encourage everyone to run their own Ethereum nodes uh, on their own. So that's, uh, thanks for joining us. I think, uh, are we doing like a QA? and uh, a Because we have like 12 minutes. Do we have 12 minutes? Okay. Yeah, if, if folks have any questions about any of this, let us know. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so specific. So I'm not a developer. So how exactly Node Launcher's, uh, or yeah, Node Launcher is dealing with secrets. Uh, yes, what we what we do have is the uh, RPC password for those nodes are actually being stored in memory. So there are elements that are being stored in memory uh, with Node Launcher, and so they're not in plain text. Uh, now we're still developing Ethereum and figuring out how are we going to handle all the you know handle everything, handle all the secrets, but we're building into Node Launcher ways to protect uh, from having, um, uh, from having you know, plain text uh, anything on your server, because we, we feel like that, that's where Node software should go, to where uh, there's a lot of security around how your, uh, what's being stored on your server and how it's being stored. Um, and so us utilizing something like memory is one way that you can put the, uh, uh, password inside of uh, uh, inside the memory and not have it be sitting on your server itself, so the RPC password. But you can actually check out the GitHub uh, as a developer and you could figure out how a lot of that's working. So I'm not a developer, so I can't get into all the specifics about it, but that's kind of a general understanding of what we're building towards. Hey, uh, thank you very much. This was really useful. Uh, so two questions. One. Uh, the only thing stopping me from running a node at home, I mean, like locally, is that I don't have a good connection. Like, I live in a very remote area. So uh, perhaps a little, I don't know, update on the best like, uh, setup for that. And the second question is, if I don't have 32 ETH and I want to run something at home, is there an option? So, uh, so to address your first one, if you have bad internet, so how penalties work in Ethereum for being lazy, right? This is either you're offline or you're not keeping up or something of that nature. The, uh, that's considered a penalty. So what a penalty can be is it can either be a reduced in rewards that you receive or it could actually be uh, where what you would have gotten if you're uh, operating optimally is deducted. So you're slashed very small amounts. So say you're, uh, so in a day, you know, maybe your internet goes out for 30 minutes or something like that. You're deducted what profit you would have made in that 30 minutes. So you lose out on that, those 30 minutes of reward, but then it essentially is almost like you lost an hour, right, of rewards because it's, you know, it's deducted, right? So so that's where you can kind of gauge, you know, you might not be as profitable, even if you're in a, 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 an area where your internet kind of cuts in and out or something like that. You just need to kind of gauge what that might look like. And maybe it's worth running a uh, validator on uh, a, one of the test networks to kind of see what the performance is like, to see, okay, would this be profitable? Would this be worth going? Um, but then uh, there are, you know, solutions and uh, I'll, I'll mention Web3 Cloud that are putting uh, uh, putting a lot of work into getting servers and getting hardware into different parts of the world, into different regions, 
uh, that are kind of outside of the you know cloud gig, so that if you really do have bad internet, there there will be options where you can deploy you know to uh, to hardware providers that aren't tied to that same like cloud cluster that we were talking about earlier. Was that both of your questions? Oh, and if you don't have 32 ETH. So if you don't have your 32 ETH, that's, uh, you, are, you can still run nodes. You can still run nodes. You, you won't get any rewards for them. Um, but uh, uh, you, you can, you know, there are other staking uh, pooling options, like Rocket Pool is a, uh, is a good one. Also, if you have friends that trust you, then maybe you can aggregate some. People do aggregate ETH amongst uh, groups of friends who may not have uh, enough ETH, and then, you know, adding a point of trust, but it's a it's an option. Uh, yes, sir. That would be the case, I would say, if if Node software wasn't being taken seriously. So with Node software, people could minimize a lot of uh, cost uh, and and also minimize certain risks by just running it at home. So while yes, you know, you could have you know large providers like AWS, you know, and it really comes down to you know six providers, as you mentioned, right? Six providers. Um, Sure, you can go that way and spend money each month, or you can have an old laptop running uh, where you're keeping all the rewards and you don't have that, that overhead, and it's that simple to run. Uh, that, so I think you're right in terms of just what tends to happen in these kind of ecosystems, but, uh, but I think because of the way that, that Ethereum's approach proofs of stake, where they intentionally put in mechanisms to incentivize more and more decentralization, I think the market will um, uh, will will match that, right? And I believe there are going to be a lot of options for node software in the future. Uh, there's already three great ones out there. Uh, we're building one ourselves, and we're building tools that allow more people to build them. So I think the future is really bright with that. Um, so that's my thought. Mm. May I may I ask if a uh, no, uh, launcher is capable to integrate the DVD? No department. Uh, I'm sorry. The what? Uh, no department. Uh, DVD. DVD. Distributed validator technology. Hmm. Uh, something like. It's what? <coughs> uh, I'm not particularly familiar. What Node Launcher is, uh, in, in a really simple term, is it's a it's actually like an API engine for Docker. So it allows you to put uh, TypeScript. Uh, commands, and then it automatically converts it into uh, what would be either sent to Docker or, or sent to uh, uh, a container inside of Docker. So because of that, yes, like it, it, the node launcher could actually be used for any container, uh, any container system. We're focused on nodes because that's our focus, but you could actually use node launcher as basically a JavaScript API to build any kind of Container-based node infrastructure, uh, or, or, or container-based um, application or management. So it's very adaptable. It can apply to any parts of the node, any parts of any container. One of the things we're building right now is the ability to deploy multiple containers. So there's some like Polygon that uh, require multiple containers, right, in order to run their node. It's actually multiple nodes. Uh, so we're building in that ability to have all those nodes all orchestrated and working together. Uh, without needing to do it manually because it's all handled through the, the engine itself. Mm. Thank you. So uh, there are, uh, so on ethereum.org, there's all that information, so I definitely check it out there. Uh, from what I remember from looking at it last night, is uh, they recommend uh, kind of on the low side, or, or on the recommended side, was a uh, i7-4470, which is 
like a 15 year old processor. So, <laughs> so yeah, and I said it from like 15 years ago or something. So anyways, yeah, Ethereum is very well equipped for uh, minimal uh, hardware requirements, unlike a lot of other networks out there. No, you just, on the server itself, needs to have those requirements, um, which are very minimal. Uh, and then their application, I believe, can just run on any computer that's running either Windows, Linux, or uh, 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 Apple, or Mac, so. Got two minutes, yeah. MEV, yep. So does your system have something similar like that to acquire and to play around with that? Absolutely. Like, so we don't have it integrated right now. I was actually just talking to our dev yesterday about it. Um, we don't have it integrated now, but it's literally a service that you run alongside your Ethereum validation. So it's a container. Yes, we can absolutely. It, and then that's what Node Launcher does. Makes running containers super easy and able to do it in a programmatic way to where it all automatically connects. So yes, MEV is absolutely possible. Hey, um, sorry. Yes, thank, thank you, you both for your um, for your talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um I've been uh, running with my own hardware. Um, wanted to get like a recommendation on like uh, what I said that was uh, pretty complicated. Like uh, you mentioned, like the resources from the Ethereum Foundation, then they then point to a random guy's uh, Medium post and another random guy's medium post which is uh, not updated, or how do I know if it's updated or not. Um, yeah. And good luck if you want to run any that are not like Geth and like a typical combination of Prism or, or Lighthouse, right? Like the documentation for anything that's not like the main ones are not existent. So um, first question, is there a source of truth in documentation which I can follow? like? Uh, to set up my own hardware with Ubuntu server and like go through it. I mean, I'm no not ma no machine or anything, but like I can. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would say eth.org is uh, it is the best place. The uh, official Ethereum documentation from the Ethereum Foundation is the, probably the best. Uh, but also, it also depends on the client that you're using. So different clients do have different hardware requirements. From my understanding, each client uh, in their documentations specifically state what their hardware requirements are. So I would actually look at the documentation for the client and see what the requirements are for that. Uh, for that. Now, the one thing you do need to be aware of is, as Maggie mentioned, you have to run a execution client. You have to run a beacon client uh, or consensus client. And you have to run a validator, which is really just a consensus client that's only job is to be a validator. So you have to run three different clients. Uh, so even though maybe the, um, the, the one client has certain hardware requirements, you have to also look at what other clients are going to be using. And then you have to you know, bring it all together. So I would say go to the client's documentation, figure out what each one is after you decide what you want your makeup to be. And you know, use the information that Maggie gave you in terms of uh, the usage on where uh, how how utilized certain clients are to make your decision. Cool. And uh, just one, I don't want to put you in a tough spot, right? But um, for the sake of decentralization, is it um, am I better off like uh, going into? Well, I don't think I could go to Dubnode or Avado because I'm running my own hardware, but like uh, using something like Ethereum or. Uh, Am I like exposing myself to uh, to any to any risks if I go like uh, install everything myself? Well, for one, you can use that note on your own hardware. So that uh, Avado is the only one where you have to have your their hardware. So you could actually on your own server use that note. Um, but uh, I, I can't really speak to actually the Ethereum.org. They actually do give uh, in talking about these different options. They do list out. Uh, different features or different elements to them where like some of them have been audited, right? Some haven't, right? So you could actually potentially use that as a way to, to, to gauge, but um, you know, most of the time with, with something like, uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, with, with stuff like uh, uh, both Dapnode and uh, Sterium, you know, they're, 
you're, those aren't things that are exposed to the public, right? So the application is just sitting on your computer and then that's connected. So if your computer were to be hacked, is how Sterium would be hacked. So the app would have to be hacked from being on your computer to be hacked. So there's gonna be risk no matter what options you use, but uh, yeah, there is some information on the Ethereum network, or Ethereum.org about that. Great, Shane Money, thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for being here so early in the morning. As I mentioned on the last day of DEF CON, you can follow us to stay up to date on what's going on with Node Launcher. And if you're a protocol uh, looking for uh, Node software or even hardware infrastructure and want to decentralize, you should contact us because that's what we uh, care about and what we like to do. So thank you so much.